So while the pages of Marvel's books over the decades have largely seen heroes fighting the good fight, doing what's right, overcoming insurmountable odds, and being role models for youngsters around the globe, there have been those other times where the creative powers that be have delivered stories that are, well, distasteful, disrespectful, or downright stomach-turning in how unsuitable they are. Now, we already covered 10 of the most inappropriate Marvel comic storylines ever, and now we're back with 10 more. Ooh boy, I'm not looking forward to this. But let's get on with it anyway, as I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are 10 more of the most inappropriate Marvel comic storylines ever. Number 10. How Angel and Husk Consummate Their Relationship Now, Chuck Austin's 2000s run on Uncanny X-Men is one that firmly split opinion amongst longtime fans of Charles Xavier's Band of Merry Mutants, and to make matters worse for Austin, his ham-fisted time on that title happened whilst Grant Morrison was wowing the world over on the new X-Men line. And amongst the many, many questionable moments of Austin's run was the relationship between Angel and Husk. There are so many weird elements to this situation, which came to a head in Uncanny X-Men number 440. There, when original X member Warren Worthington III and the much younger Paige Guthrie became romantically entwined, Warren sits down to have a heart-to-heart -heart with Paige's mother. And there not only does Angel explain how he's afraid of having something horrible happen to yet another love interest, he also reveals how Husk has already died whilst under his supervision and how he managed to revive her. Despite the age gap between Angel and 19-year-old Paige, her mother is apparently all for Warren becoming an official item with her daughter. And not just that, but Husk berates Warren about how she is of legal age to make her own mistakes in most states. If all of that wasn't questionable enough, Angel and Husk then fly up into the air and have sex above the head of Paige's mother, complete with one of her daughter's shoes falling onto the startled mother. Brilliant. Number 9. Invisible Woman Becomes a Supervillain After Suffering a Miscarriage When looking at the Fantastic Four, the beating heart and moral compass of the team is so often Sue Storm. Whilst Reed Richards' arrogance and obsession with work often gets the better of him, Johnny Storm's hot-headedness can cause him to make rash decisions, and Ben Grimm's inner turmoil and insecurity can rise to the surface, it usually comes down to Sue to steady the Fantastic Ship. Back in 1984, though, in Fantastic Four number 267's A Small loss, Marvel Comics completely bungled the Invisible Woman, who became pregnant with her and Reed's second child. Tragically, the radiation damage previously done to Sue's cells caused her to suffer a miscarriage. In terms of how this extremely sensitive matter was bungled, well, Storm and her loss played second fiddle to other parts of this story. Firstly, so much of the focus was on whether or not Reed and Dr. Octopus could coexist to help save their unborn child. Secondly, once tragedy does indeed strike, everybody just gets on with their business as usual usual, whilst leaving Sue alone with her grief. To only do further injustice to the Sue Storm character, Marvel Comics then had Sue don a bondage-style outfit and become a supervillain known as Malice. Sure, this was due to a scheme from Psycho Man, but still, this was all so misguided from Marvel. Number 8. Cyclops and Emma Frost hook up on Jean Grey's grave of Charles Xavier's famed team of mutants, one particular person who has made some pretty boneheaded decisions over the years is Cyclops. So often the leader of the X-Men, Scott Summers, is a sucker for romance. And by sucker, that means he does some outright disgusting stuff in the name of love. With Jean very much dead by this point, Scott is unsure whether to follow his urges and move on from Jean and make a move on Frost. Given how Jean Grey is Jean Grey, she was actually able to visit Psyche from beyond the grave, giving her blessing to seek new love. Now, while that absolutely gives Scott free reign to pursue the White Queen, could he maybe have not made the careless move of sharing a kiss with Frost on Jean Grey's resting place? That's just not cool, Summers. So, not cool. Number 7. Leather Boy Commits Unnatural Acts on Monkey Joe Before Murdering Him Monkey Joe had been at the side of Squirrel Girl since her first appearance back in 1991's Marvel Superheroes Vol. 2, number 8. So, when the furry sidekick was killed off in GLA number 3 in 2005, it was a jarring moment for readers. That death obviously left Squirrel Girl devastated, but even more troubling was the manner in which Doreen's long-standing BFF was offed. As is explained to the audience, rejected Great Lake Avengers and perennial D-list rogue Leatherboy carried out unnatural acts on Monkey Joe before stamping on the poor squirrel's brain. Death in comics is always a rough, emotional subject, and likewise the death of an animal is doubly rough. But to have it insinuated that Leatherboy had his wicked way with Monkey Joe before the creature was then murdered makes it all kinds of disturbing. Number 6. X-23's Teenage Sex Worker Origin 
What some may not know is that X-23 was first introduced in the X-Men Evolution animated series in 2003. There she was shown as a Wolverine clone engineered to wipe out Logan. By the time of her comic book Bow the following year, a more murkier and more questionable element was added into the formative days of the young Laura Kinney. Well, rather than going straight from a Weapon X lab to meeting and eventually trusting the X-Men, X-23 was first seen working as a teenage sex worker who specialized in dealing with clients with all kinds of creepy and torturous tastes. Working for a sinister pimp named Zebra Daddy, the decision to bring Laura into the comics in such a way was at best questionable and, at worst, outright ridiculous. In fact, it's a testament to the X-23 character and subsequent writers for getting Laura back on track in the comics and making her such a beloved figure. Number 5. Tony Stark's Creepy and Possessive Iron Man Armor Back in the year of 2000, the My Own Worst Enemy and Blood Brothers tales saw Tony Stark tormented by an extremely possessive suit of Iron Man armor that was deeply in love with Stark. Due to a mix of the Y2K bug, an attack from the nefarious Whiplash, and the installation of a new consciousness, Tony awakens from a heart attack to find that one of his suits has become fully sentient. In addition to this, said suit has had full access to all of Stark's memories and feelings, and thus it compares its own feelings for Tony to the feelings that Tony had for his then love interest of Fujikawa. Still, old Shellhead decides to take this suit out for a spin as he looks to track down the aforementioned Whiplash. Upon finding the rogue, though, the armor takes control and brutally beats the villain to death, regardless of Stark's pleas to stop. By the next issue, the sentient Iron Man is threatening Fujikawa's life and soon engages in an all-out fight with Tony Stark. Easily besting his creator, the armor kidnaps Tony and takes him to an island in the Pacific, where the pair later do battle once more. In a twist ending, though, this battle causes Stark to have another heart attack, a fatal one for that matter, and this results in the smitten, obsessive Iron Man suit removing its own heart and placing it in Tony's chest in order to save the armored Avenger's life. Number 4. Nightcrawler Becomes the Pope much like hearing the words one more day puts a cold shiver down the spine of Spider-Man fans, the mutter of holy war amongst X-Men readers would generate a similar and very uncomfortable reaction. Again from Chuck Austin's run on Uncanny X-Men, this tale finds Kurt corrupted by a villainous group of the Catholic Church, who seek to erase any and all mutants. As part of this scheme, these sinister sorts have Kurt shapeshift into the form of the Pope. In a loose sense, it's not the central plot of holy war that's particularly inappropriate, but more in how poorly handled all of it is. What could have been a nuanced and thought-provoking delve into the extremisms of Catholicism, it instead delved into a ham-fisted, cartoonish, zany way that made it impossible to take seriously. Far too bonkers to be cited as an exploration of problems with the Catholic Church, Holy War is just an all-round cluster f of the highest order. There's a small semblance of a point to this story, but any points of validity are definitely lost in a sea of cartoonish slapstick. Number 3. Hulk's Cannibalism and uh, Shit Analysis while the Ultimate Universe has provided some brilliant moments and characters, there have been plenty of times where this corner of Marvel Comics just left fans in puzzled bemusement or disappointment at what they'd just seen. So step forward, The Ultimates. Launching in 2002, this was a title that saw Mark Miller and Brian Hitch provide a modern-day update on the famed Avengers. Set in the confines of Earth-1610, the Earth's mightiest heroes, initially consisting of Nick Fury, Captain America, Iron Man, Wasp, Giant Man, and Thor, of this realm went by the name of the Ultimates. While several takes on beloved characters very much split opinion in the Ultimates, likely none irked longtime fans more as seeing the depiction of this Hulk. And in particular, the events of the Ultimate number 13 left readers flabbergasted at the antics of the Green Goliath. Here, the nefarious Herr Kleiser, having got the better of Fury, Cap, and company, meant that the Hulk was finally sent into battle. As part of this, a bunch of S.H.I.E.L.D. personnel beat the utter piss out of poor Bruce Banner in order for him to transform into his alter ego. Thrown from a helicopter, Banner transforms in just enough time to tackle Kleiser, beat him to a literal mush, and then eat him. Yep, that's right, the Ultimate Hulk is a cannibal. Taking this to an even stranger level, the Ultimates later wait for the Hulk to shit him out so that they can analyze and fully destroy the rogue's remains. Number 2. Wolverine tries to seduce a 15-year-old Mary Jane Watson Back in 2004's Ultimate Spider-Man number 66 and 67, readers got a story that took a familiar trope and spun quite the fun tale, and that trope was the classic body swap. Here Spider-Man and Wolverine wake up one morning to find themselves in the other person's body. What follows are some genuine chuckles as Peter Parker struggles to not cut off his own fingers, whilst Logan is just pissed off at having to go to school and is startled at every turn by his spider senses. But where it takes a dark turn is when the two heroes are eventually back in their own bodies. There, Peter 
is aghast when Mary Jane asks, that thing you tried to do this morning, can we not do that till we're older? With the insinuation being that Wolverine in Parker's body tried to have sex with MJ. And it's worth stating here that Mary Jane Watson is 15 years of age here. To add another layer of creepiness to matters, it's revealed that the teenage Jean Grey was behind the entire body swap experience, with her doing this as punishment for Wolverine trying to constantly hit on her. And number one, the Punisher changes race. It was hugely insensitive when DC Comics made Lois Lane black for one day in 1970. The Daily Planet reporter wanted to experience the life of a black woman, being the reason why, and it was just baffling when Marvel Comics decided to follow suit with this a whole 21 years later with The Punisher. For Frank Castle, this change of race came during 1991's The Final Days arc. Finding himself holed up in prison, Frank is brutally attacked by Jigsaw and his goons, to the point that Castle's face is a complete mess. The Punisher being The Punisher, Though, he manages to escape the confines and make a break for freedom. But the hunt is on, from both the police and from the criminals, to find the vigilante. In order to hide himself from those that are after him, Frank turns to a junkie doctor who agrees to do facial surgery on him. But once the Punisher awakens, the doc has somehow managed to change Castle's skin color, his bone structure, and features, even going so far as to give him a haircut to, quote, go with the look. Realizing what a downright awful idea all of this was, Marvel would reverse all of this just seven issues later, with the plastic surgery apparently wearing off mid-fight as Frank's longer hair miraculously grew back immediately. All of this, needless to say, was utterly terrible, in both taste and in terms of storytelling. And there we go, my friends. Those were 10 more of the most inappropriate Marvel comic storylines ever. I hope that you uh, enjoyed that or at least got something out of it. And let me know what you thought about it down in the comment section below. As always, I've been Jules. You have been awesome. Never forget that. And I'll speak to you soon. Bye.